Hi, my name is Dr Zoe Jacobs and I'm an ocean scientist at the National Oceanography Centre. Welcome to our Early Career Scientist podcast. So I'm here today with Sarah Taylor, one of NOC's Early Career Scientists, and we're going to discuss her path to becoming an environmental economist. Hi Sarah, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing, Zoe? I'm really good, thanks. Good. So first of all, I really wanted to talk to you um, about your route to becoming an environmental economist. Um, I personally had quite a convoluted route to becoming an ocean modeller. Mm. So I'd love to hear about how you ended up getting into this area. Yeah, it's a great question. I think initially my degree was quite heavily rooted in mainstream economics. Mm. Um, and I studied in South Africa. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of scope to get specialized pretty early on. So in my third de- uh, year of my degree, I decided to try and seek out more uh, modules around developmental economics and environmental economics. And um, I just found myself naturally gravitating towards that kind of applied economics. I liked seeing the outcome of, of the research and the theory rather than just yeah sticking to the theory itself. So it was really lovely to be able to um, find that I excelled more in those classes because of seeing the direct application to real world challenges, which was really lovely. And um, yeah, I just loved the more interdisciplinary approach to the research and how I could see it would be a really good link to link the research to policy Mm -hmm. um, and start looking at that bridge. At the time, I didn't realize it would be coined later on, like bridging the gap between science and policy. (laughs) Um, So I'm really glad I got into it. Yeah, we hear that quite a lot, actually, um, bridging that gap between um, the scientists and um, getting into the more kind of nature based solutions and exactly. getting it all into policy. Um, yeah. So, so you start, so your degree was in economics. Yes. And then um, was there a defining moment when you decided to move into more marine or environmental economics? Yeah, so I actually also I decided towards the end of my degree to uh, dual major with mathematical statistics, quite a, quite a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to be able to have a quantitative approach um, to this type of research too. Um, I think I understood also from like a policymaker's point of view, it's quite quite important to to have numbers to this kind of research. And um, I also felt that. Um, I wanted to get more into understanding food security. So that was something Mm -hmm. when I was traveling after university, I was working on farms and I thought it would be really interesting to get into understanding food systems from an economic um, and policy point of view. So, and uh, I thought it would be all land-based and I'd have to, you know, stick to um, agriculture. And along came Mike Roberts, who, (laughs) for for listeners who don't know, he's a really cool, crazy scientist here at (laughs) NOC. Um, and he also has one foot still in South Africa. Um, he's a South African and he's a professor at a university in South Africa. So um, I luckily was introduced to him and we uh, were supposed to have a 30 minute quick conversation um, about my potential master's research. And it suddenly turned into this two hour long conversation, as as you know, with Mike. Yes. <laughs> we were just getting into it and having so much fun. And he successfully convinced me that I needed to, to do marine food security which was wonderful because at the time, as I said, I thought it would have to be all land-based research. And I've always had such a passion for the ocean. And I thought this was fantastic, but also terrifying because there wasn't a lot of literature out there at the time in this move towards marine food security. But I think that was really great too, to be part of um, like the... (laughs) the wave you know me and my friends <laughs> the wave of new research towards um yeah like applying economics to the marine space so it's been a challenge but um it's also it's been a really great challenge yeah that's really cool so you mentioned there that um you've always been kind of passionate about the ocean so has it always played such a significant um role in your life it has and I think I remember back to um throwing it back to when I was about eight years old um I was always walking around saying, I'm going to be a marine biologist. And that's before <laughs> I realized how shocking I was at biology. <laughs> so I had to stick to economics. But um, my grand gave me a book on um, understanding the sea and the ocean, you know, and all that's just lovely, like picture book. And I just decided at that time um, I was going to save the sea by not eating the sea. So I stopped eating <laughs> seafood, which my poor parents they had to <laughs> live with a little vegetarian. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess it then spilled over into understanding I was an environmentalist at heart. It, it came from, yeah, just a deep wanting to understand this beautiful world um, beneath the, the ocean surface. So um, yeah, it's been a lovely part of a lot of my life. So passion in, you know, dietary choices as well as career. Mm. So it's a, it's a big part of my life. Oh, that's so lovely. That's, um, I imagine quite a few of us here at NOC feel the same way. Yeah. Um, so you are actually currently the only marine economist that we have at NOC. <laughs> yeah. um, so how do you find working here in general, and working with lots of kind of hardcore oceanographers? Um, do you think you're in the right place for your research? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I reflected on this quite a lot recently coming up to, it's almost, I think, yeah, three and a half years here. Um, and I think it's been the best challenge of my career. And also I'd say life so far in the sense it's really pushed me out of um, my comfort zone for many reasons. But I think it also helped um, being an early career researcher and like bright eyed and bushy tailed and like just ready <laughs> for the challenge. Um, and it initially was really, I remember it being very overwhelming and sitting in our first meeting and, um, you know, hearing all of these wild and wonderful acronyms and being like, yeah, 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 we need to include SST in this and then quickly Googling <laughs> what is SST. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> sea surface temperature. I knew that. I uh, <laughs> hope my boss doesn't hear this. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it really did help me, I think, um, put me right into the deep end of mm -hmm. understanding when you wor work in interdisciplinary research. I think a lot of the time we see um, institutions or organizations specializing separately, which obviously has its pros too, and then sort of outsourcing, you know, the different skills and working on projects, um, which of course is also a, a very viable model. But it has been such a good challenge for me as an economist to sit in a room with people who speak a completely different language. Mm. And it has taught me to just ask those, what you would assume to be silly questions yeah. um, and just be like, hey, sorry guys, do you mind just explaining that terminology yeah. and why you do this kind of research? And I feel that's what it's been so powerful. It's, it's still you know, it's taking its time to get there, but understanding those links where we can really start building powerful research that's mm. genuinely connected from the start instead of siloed approaches to, well, yeah. let's do the economics of this problem, let's do the oceanography of this problem. How do we really join forces? And I think we've had these discussions yeah. personally over a glass of wine um, about like <laughs> <laughs> um, understanding the difference in the terminology and how that can be like gatekeeping in a way to yes. to research that is really integrated but um overall i think it is definitely the the right place for me in this part of my career and moving forward it's been a wonderful challenge good because we want to keep you here i Yay. certainly do anyway i have learned <laughs> so much just working with you and as you say you had to learn all of our funky abbreviations yeah. and terminology and i've had to also learn your abbreviations <laughs> and your terminology but it's been a really good kind of lesson i think for many oceanographers here just in terms of understanding how important it is to communicate our research even with our colleagues who might not be specifically in our field so yeah yeah, I think that's been, <laughs> it's been a good journey and we're getting there. I feel like we know each other's abbreviations now. Exactly. We're getting there. <laughs> um, I guess on that, let's um, turn to your research. So I'm conscious that this is a topic of a much kind of wider question, but um, could you talk to us about, or just kind of give us an overview of your, of your research and the work that you've done at NOC so far? Yeah, and... Um I'm actually realizing it's such a good question also to practice exactly what we've just been talking about, about being mindful of, of jargon. So I'm going to avoid using any very economic description <laughs> of, of this. And basically, if I had to give a, a, a quite a simple overview, it's just about understanding how economies and communities are reliant on the ocean. So, um, you know, for example, um, how reliant we are on fish as a food source, mm -hmm. as well as how reliant we are on the fishing industry to generate income. So how much our government relies on that, um, you know, sending fish out of the country, bringing fish in, how are we generating money, how are we creating jobs from that? Mm -hmm. So it's a very, you know, how essentially um, ocean resources, as in like the fish or um, oil and gas, all that complicated industry, how that is impacting um, our day-to-day lives within countries um, and I think what's really important and interesting is seeing how we now look at ocean health and wealth is, is changing with climate change and you know everything else going on so it's about understanding okay we see how communities and economies depend on the ocean the ocean's changing so how can we help governments mitigate that risk and say mm -hmm. well we know this community really depends on that area of the ocean for the specific type of fish so if that fish disappears what does that mean who's impacted and how can we potentially um you know create policy that will um, lessen that that kind of negative impact um, mm. with the ocean changing as much as it is yeah so that's that's it in a nutshell and hopefully <laughs> that, that makes sense <laughs> yeah absolutely um i mean it's so important um at the moment kind of all re all research is kind of heading towards um, for us especially what's going to happen with climate change and yeah. trying to understand how these resources are going to be impacted because that's going to be I mean that's going to be a huge um, it's going to be a huge kind of societal challenge exactly. it already is yeah. and let alone what's going to happen in future so um, 
I I worked with you on a project um, called Solstice. Yes. Um, can you maybe give us some kind of specific example about something you some some kind of or one of your papers or something yeah. you worked on specifically, just to give our listeners kind of an idea of the more kind of specific research that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the most yeah the the final paper within that research uh, project Solstice was looking at um, specifically the fishing communities and how they're connected to the marine resources as in um, the type of fish that they were catching mm-hmm. and what for what purpose they were using that fish for. So food security in, is, is just understanding um, how people, con- what kind of food is being consumed and dependent on and how that f- food is then sold and generates mm. income. So um, we did a study on looking at specifically what type of species of fish were most important for what fishes and mm-hmm. especially small scale fisheries. So yeah. that was a really important part of um, my research within solstice was understanding that there's artisanal fishes who um, are overlooked in a lot of uh, economic data that's captured in, mm. you know, like on a national scale and more ex- easily accessible data as economists, what data we access for research. It's it's a lot of um, smaller scale fishes are not represented enough yeah. in that data. And then research can just not include them, which is, is terrible because they potentially are at the forefront of these yeah. impacts with the ocean changing exactly. as much as it is. And this is incredibly important because this particular research was in uh, Tanzania. Yes. Um, where these kind of small scale fisheries are incredibly important, right? Yeah. Um, but you're also doing a couple of projects now kind of more UK based. So it's also yeah. important everywhere it's not just kind of looking at the kind of smaller smaller scale fisheries yeah absolutely and that's a really good point and something I do um, as part of the research I want to look at moving forward is understanding that um, the world is so connected right and so in your world Mm. of research it's been so beautiful to have my eyes opened to how everything's so connected so you know we talk about I've learned so much about connectivity ocean connectivity Mm. from you and um, understanding I think from an economics perspective and the way that we're trained it's so like um, territorial in a way you've got your country and then you've got your you know your EEZ which is essentially the part of the ocean that you have um, your rights you own as a country um, and you can govern in the way that you would like to um, and it's 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 really been such a great change of perspective for me to understand that that you know the ocean is const- constantly moving throughout those jurisdictions. Mm. You don't actually you can't say this fish is mine; it's going to stay here yeah. forever. So, <laughs> so um, trying to look forward and understanding, you know, research um, done in UK is going to impact um, mm. countries in Africa because UK and EU are importing fish from Tanzania. Yes. And Tanzania, most of their fish is actually exported to mm. um, to the like global north. So it's it's also interconnected, and mm. I think it's important to understand those specific trade links and yeah. what that means. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. So, um, where do you see your research kind of going in future? I bet you have plenty of ideas as to yeah. what you want to do over the coming years. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I do also really want to be part of this new way of thinking of um, integrating models. So yeah. looking at how policymakers will often need tools to make decisions. So how to look at the trade off So if you're going to decide to um, build a harbour, where do you build mm. that harbour? Um, and if you're going to build in this specific area, what communities are going to be impacted um, positively or negatively? So in understanding that, I want to be part of... Um, the move of ec- economists that are saying we can't just use economic models that look at only the monetary value of these kind of decisions. So models that can incorporate environmental data, mm. um, that can represent smaller parts of society that's potentially overlooked because, you know, there's maybe not like a monetary value attached to um, the historical or heritage cultural value of that area of, of an ocean space. So um, I will get back to you when I have a specific <laughs> name. <laughs> We'll my, invite you back. <laughs> yeah, for my new job title. <laughs> but essentially, it's just, yeah, um, a more holistic approach yeah. to these problems um, yeah. instead of just there's the, the dollar yeah. sign. I think that's brilliant. That's the way that kind of all research is moving into in mm. general, I think. So that's really good. Um, so just out of interest, did you um, change any of your or your family's kind of habits as a result of your research? I think it has been quite interesting um, just becoming more aware of I don't have fish on my plate, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, but my family has become a lot more aware of, you know, where is this fish from? Yeah. And like, and, and specifically in South Africa, it's quite interesting. Um, and part of our solstice research was mm. looking at the chocolate squid industry. Yes. And realizing that most of that squid is exported to to Europe, and um, then we import 
like you know a different grade of squid yeah. back into South Africa and I think yeah, that level crazy, of awareness it? yeah it's so strange it's just like global food equation, I know. <laughs> food just moving constantly yeah. around um but it's it's been really great to see how there's just a, a new level of consciousness and asking those kind of questions yeah, yeah. no absolutely um, and finally then, um, just a word of advice for anyone that's listening, um, that's inspi- uh, uh, that is aspiring, sorry, to become an environmental or marine economist. I think uh, I would say, don't be afraid to work with scientists <laughs> that, are not, <laughs> that are not economists. We're not that scary. Exactly. <laughs> Look how cute you are. <laughs> but yeah, so I think, especially if you are interested in moving into looking at problems holistically, it's, mm. it's um, a really important and yeah. valuable lesson to sit alongside those people that think differently and ask those questions that you, you may think yeah. are silly. I think it has, um, yeah, it's helped. I know it has helped me a lot mm. with my career. And I think that would be the most valuable Amazing. lesson to share. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Zoe. <laughs>